Welcome to Lecture 8. In today's lecture, we will define two new state functions, the Hemholtz free energy and the Gibbs free energy, and we will use the latter to draw phase diagrams of single component systems. This lecture will be broken down into two parts. In the first, we will define two new state functions, the Helmholtz free energy and the Gibbs free energy. In the second part, we will use how the Gibbs free energy varies as a function of pressure and temperature to draw phase diagrams for single component systems. The phase boundaries on these diagrams can be defined using the Clapeyron equation and the Clausius-Clapeyron equation. Always quantifying both the entropy change for the system and the surroundings to determine spontaneity is cumbersome. Instead, it is convenient to write the change in entropy total in terms of the system alone. To accomplish this, let's start by writing that very small changes in the total entropy is equal to very small changes in the entropy of the system and that of the surroundings. For a reversible process, we can write that small changes in the entropy of the surroundings is equal to the negative change in the heat transferred from the system divided by the temperature. We saw this relationship in the lecture on entropy. This heat transferred can be rewritten into two different state functions depending upon the conditions. If the process is uh, at constant volume, then it can be written as a small change in the internal energy. If the process is at constant pressure, then it can be written as a small change in the enthalpy. This slide is broken in half, where the left side is where the process is at constant volume and the right side is at constant pressure. They will follow an almost identical procedure. In both cases, we will multiply through by negative t to get negative t ds total is equal to du minus t ds system for the constant volume process and minus t ds total is equal to dh minus t ds system for the constant pressure process. At this point we will define two new state functions. The Helmholtz free energy is defined as capital A and it's equal to u minus ts. The Gibbs free energy is defined as capital G and it's equal to h minus ts. If we calculate small isothermal changes in these new state functions, starting with the Helmholtz free energy, we get the infinitesimal change of the free energy minus T times D entropy system minus the entropy of the system times DT. The two terms with temperature and entropy arise from applying the product rule. For the Gibbs free energy, we get the infinitesimal change in the enthalpy times T DS system minus S system times DT. In both cases, the entropy of the system times dt term goes to zero because this is an isothermal process, so there aren't any small changes in temperature, which is what dt represents. What that means is that for both the infinitesimal change of the Hemholtz free energy and the Gibbs free energy is equal to the negative of the entropy of the total for the system. Therefore, quantifying Hemholtz or Gibbs free energies quantifies if a process is spontaneous. Let's now look at the Hemholtz free energy and determine what it represents. First of all, as was just stated, it can be used to determine if a process is spontaneous. Consider a process A plus B is in equilibrium with C plus D. We can calculate the change in internal energy and entropy of a process at a given temperature to find the change in Hemholtz free energy. This will tell us the change in the total entropy for the process times the negative temperature. This is very useful because the terms used to find delta A are all based on the system. The plot on the bottom left illustrates both entropy and Helmholtz free energy as a function of reaction coordinate, and you can see that they are mirror images of each other. As one increases, the other decreases. This is from the negative sign in the relationship between them. So, processes with positive entropy changes are spontaneous. This means that they must have a negative change in the Hemholtz free energy to be spontaneous. If delta A is equal to zero, then the system is at equilibrium. And finally, if delta A is greater than zero, then the reverse process is spontaneous. The change in Hemholtz free energy also quantifies the total work possible by a process. To show this relationship between delta A and work, we will assume that the process is reversible. At constant temperature, dA is equal to du minus T dS. Then, using the first law of thermodynamics, where du is equal to dW plus dQ, means that dA is equal to dW plus dQ minus T dS. Since T dS is equal to dQ, because it's a reversible process, then we can cancel out the dQ terms, and that what we see in the end is that dA is equal to dW. 
since this relation holds for each infinitesimal step, then delta A is equal to the total work. Let's now look at our first example where we're going to examine this relationship between the change in Hemholtz free energy and the total amount of work that can be extracted from a process. So what we're going to do first is we're going to consider the metabolism of glucose to water and carbon dioxide at 25 degrees Celsius. And because the Hemholtz free energy is a state function, then even though we're talking about something that's going to be metabolized, being the sugar, we can look at just the overall reaction. And since it's path independent, we can still get a calculation of the total amount of work that's possible by metabolizing sucrose, or sorry, glucose in this case. And so what we have here is some calorimic measurements. We have the change in the reaction of the internal energy of negative 2801.3 kilojoules per mole. And the change in entropy for the reaction is 260.7 joules per kelvin per mole. And so the question is asking how much energy can be extracted as work. So we'll just start with the definition of the change in Helmholtz free energy. Delta A is equal to the total work which is equal to the change in internal energy minus T times delta S. Well, we're given a value for the change in internal energy, we're given a value for the change in entropy, and we know the temperature. So we'll just plug in those values. Negative 2801.3 minus 25 degrees Celsius plus 273.15, and that converts it to Kelvin. We're going to write our change in entropy in terms of kilojoules per mole. So that's going to be 260.7 times 10 to the minus 3. If I evaluate that second term, minus 2801.3, minus 77.7. And what we left in the end is minus 2879 kilojoules per mole. The one thing that I want you to notice about this um, result is that the total work that was calculated here is actually greater than the change in internal energy of the process. And why this is the case is because we have an increase in the entropy of the reaction. And so because of that, this reaction is spontaneous, it actually then helps contribute to being able to do more work than what is actually stored as the internal energy for this process.